afternoon trainiacs. Today we're doing something a little bit different. NTK. Hi. And I are going to record a podcast and it's going to be a recap of Kona. We did the recap video talking about the day, but I didn't really have a podcast after or an interview after or a chat with us after talking about a lot of the stories that came out of that day. So we're going to get our podcast on and we're actually going to tape the whole thing. If you're not into sitting here on YouTube and watching an entire podcast, go to Triathlon Terran podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and you can listen to the whole thing. But if you are into it, here you go. Here we go. This is like a behind the scenes of a podcast and an in the scenes of a vlog. Hey, what's up, Trainiacs? Taryn here with co-host NTK. We are exactly one week after Kona, and uh, we figure we might as well do a Kona roundup. There were a lot of stories that came out of the pro race and uh, kind of just the week of Kona, so I thought we'd sit down here and recap a lot of the stories that I want to talk about. We got NTK. What is, uh, before we get into a lot of the stories that I want to talk about, what's your take on Kona? How'd you like it? Oh, man. So good. Everyone who is into triathlon needs to go to that. Just, you know, I mean, we've been before, but it's just magical. And I know that sounds cliche and stuff, but it really is kind of this magical week. And there's a special feeling the whole time you're there leading up to it. And race day is just, you can't even imagine it. If you've never experienced it, you can't imagine it. It's so great. Take, yeah. take a vacation. Go see, go see the Iron Man in Kona. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We went there back in 2013 for the first time for our honeymoon. I totally hijacked our honeymoon. And when we were on the way there, like in the, the month leading up to it, you were like, yeah, well, we're going to Kona. And Taryn picked our honeymoon. And then after that week, you're like, Kona. That's amazing. We have to go every year. Kona's the best place. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty great. Yeah, it was a... We feel really lucky to have been able to go there. And to be perfectly honest with you, I got pretty teary-eyed as Patrick Lang came across the finish line, not because of the race, but it was like a combination of the race being as special as it was, having two course records broken, the, the bike course record and the overall course record being there for that. And then like the, the fact that four years ago when we went there, we were there as like an aside we had to save up money for it and it was something that I did off to the side when we had time to take time away from work and now triathlon you mean triathlon yeah yeah and and now the fact that it like it is work and and that work is me standing on a media stage uh, with ripped off sleeves and board shorts and that's work now and that work is real life and real life is triathlon and like it's it was kind of touching that that in that four years life has changed so much and it's uh, it was cool to be there on that day and I am very grateful that all of the the followers are basically what allow me to do it so thank you all thanks for, followers thanks followers thanks trainiacs yeah trainiacs are good people so let's get into some of the stories that happened that uh that race day it was a special day uh NTK is going to take part where she can uh, because she was there <laughs> doing the Instagram stories, if anyone followed. Um, but uh, yeah, let's chat Iron Man Kona. So probably uh, the biggest story was the winner of the men's race, Patrick Lang. Lange? Lange. 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 Yeah, know. I got beaked hard in the YouTube comments because I was saying Lang. Lang. Right, Lange. But, yeah. Okay, so Patrick Lange won, uh, and that was only his fourth Ironman, which is amazing if you watched him run that race. He looked so good, so fresh on the run, and that's only his fourth Ironman. That's crazy to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he, he grew up in Europe racing short course and getting a lot of speed, and then it was... It was early in 2016, apparently, that he did his, his first race in which he qualified for Kona. Comes to Kona last year, breaks the run course record, makes it onto the podium, and then he still have to, when you, when you finish high in Kona, you basically have to just go and validate your spot and finish a race the, the next year to get your spot in Kona. It's not like an automatic... We have Petey here guarding us from leaves outside. Easy, bud. Easy. 
So you have to go and validate your spot. It's not an automatic entry for the rest of your life. He went and validated his spot in early 2017. And thus, Ironman Kona 2017 was only his fourth Ironman. And That's and just wild. Yeah, yeah. Many and people that, spend their lives training to get to this thing, to qualify for this thing, right? Like years and years. Yeah, yeah. And the the thing about that that I take as a really big indication of how special that is, is that he hasn't had years and years of time in the saddle. So so if you don't know Patrick Lange, he basically wins it all entirely on the run. He came out second pack in the swim, second pack in the bike. He's not a phenomenal biker. He had to move up from 10th place and 11 minutes all the way up to the lead. So he basically won the entire race on the run. And what that tells me is that he has a long way that he can still go and improve in the sport because he doesn't have decades of bike fitness experience. He's got it in short course, but he hasn't yet built it in long course. Hence, if he spends a bunch of time on the bike, there's a ton of room for improvement. Pair that with his awesome run skills, and you could have a guy that could be breaking his own record next year and his own record again the year after. And he's still young, where a lot of really top-notch Ironman athletes don't reach their peak until 34, 35. We're talking about a guy that could basically set a new standard for, for speed in Ironman like Tiger Woods did in golf and everyone else has to start chasing him and bringing like basically just flat out regular marathon speed to marathon and Ironman speed. So I, I think that it wasn't necessarily a dominant performance where he's beating people by 10 and 20 minutes, but I think it's a performance that gives indication that sets a He could eventually beat them by 10 and 20 minutes. Yeah. And he could potentially set a new standard that mentally it's like breaking the four minute mile and running that people go like, holy smokes, all of a sudden, if I'm going to step up to the Ironman course distance, I got to be running t- 240 or better off the bike. And, uh, and we saw little glimpses of that being, the new expectation. So yeah, that was big. And what's his way back background? Like, why is he such a freak of nature? He's just built for it. You look at his stride in running and it's natural. He's, he's thin, he's light, he, he's upright. His structure is built for running really well. Um, he's not so, he's not like Lionel Sanders where he's, he's a big muscular guy. So that allows him to be be efficient and fluid and do well in Kona because he's not pushing this big machine and having a huge sweat rate. So as long as he stays cool and he's allowed to stay, or he can keep himself strong enough that he doesn't break down towards the end of a marathon, he can keep that running pace and that fluid running stride for 26.2 miles, which Mm. he did. I think the next few years of Kona are going to be very interesting with Jan Frodeno, uh, Sebi, now Sanders and Lange, it's going to be quite the competition for the top. Like, I think it's going to be a very fun race to watch in the next few years. Well, and I think in that time, you're also going to have guys like Javier Gomez coming in. Your favorite. Javi. He's, Your little guy. Yeah, yeah. Fellow he's a little, little guy like you. Little muscular dude. Him coming in. Um, basically, all these ITU athletes coming into it with a really big base of speed. Uh, it's going to yeah. change the game. Yeah. It's going to be dangerous. Well, and so speaking of different people with speed and different things coming into it, um, the super bikers were not really able to dominate the field this time. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't seem like that even works anymore. Jan Ferdino beat Sebi, Langa beat Sanders. Like, Yeah, you've got now, um, as opposed to say 10, 12 years ago, you would have guys like Norman Stadler coming in. Uh, even just four years ago, I think it was uh, when Sebi came in and just dominated, crushed the bike, and was a good enough runner to hold people off. But now you're getting uh, you're getting super bikers that year after year are trying to come in, dominate the field, beat up on the main contender, hold the main contender like Jan Ferdino off on the run, and they haven't been able to do it for a number of years. They they beat up on Jan enough, and we'll get to Jan towards the end, but they beat up on Jan enough to take him out, but that could have been something with his body structure, could have been just an off day, could have been something nutritionally. But year after year, what we're finding is the runners 
are coming in. And unless you have one of the fastest runs on the day, Daniela had the fastest run on the day. Patrick Lang had the fastest run on the day and consistently they're winning. And you can see that down in ITU that it's not a swimmer's race. It's not a biker's race. It's a little bit more biker's race in this full distance, but you have to back that up with a really strong run. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So with Lionel Sanders, I mean, there was a lot made of him before the race. Um, there was quite a bit on YouTube talking about his training style, his work ethic, um, all the sort of the strange quirks he's bringing to the sport. He's doing things differently than a lot of other people. Um, he's also super analytical. Um, you know, he's bringing a whole different thing to this. And he's been on the podium before and he was almost on the top of the podium this year. Uh, which kind of proves this point that you've made in the past, which is you've got to be on the podium before you're going to win. Yeah, I I heard over the course of the week that when they were talking about Sanders not winning, they said something like, uh, you've got to be on the podium before you're on the top of the podium. Because Kona is a different beast. Kona is a race that we're chatting with Bob Babbitt throughout the week, the uh, guy that's been in the sport since 1980. And he says that in in the top 25 guys, you've probably got 25 guys that have been top 10 and they could go anywhere from fifth to 20th because it's such a deep field. And there are so many things that you've got to figure out in Kona and this being Sanders just second time, he approached the race in 2016 as if he had to train immense amounts. And he did 13 days that were seven and a half hour plus days in 2016 overcooked himself, got to the race, was tired. This year he went the entire opposite way. Didn't really do any days besides I think one that was seven and a half hours. And the second he felt fatigue in 2017, he gave himself two days off completely and then another two days of rest. So he came in entirely different. He's figuring, and and then this year has a phenomenal race, but was like running like a rusted up lawn chair would move. <laughs> and what he said was he he figured out that after the race, he was eating potato chips and Gatorade. And as soon as he started getting electrolytes back into his system, he could move again. He thought that he wasn't going to be able to walk for days. He was so sore. And all of a sudden, three hours after the race, he's like, I he's can got walk. his full range of motion back. I can walk. Yeah. I, I feel fine. Everything's good. Next day, wasn't sore. So to him he's learning that it wasn't a physical issue. It wasn't a training issue. He's got to now figure out the nutritional issue. And, and, and that's kind of the thing about Sanders that he goes at it like a freaking nut job <laughs> that he trains. Like it, he doesn't see the light of day. He, he does swimming either at the pool or now he's got an endless pool in his basement that he's built. And he looks at himself in a mirror swimming he does pretty much all of his riding on rollers or on a trainer on Zwift indoors with these this sound system booming right in his face. And I think he's got away from a lot of the treadmill work because he's realized they need some of that side-to-side body structure stability. And he's doing a fair bit more running outside. But if you look at Sanders in any interview, he says that that he's analyzing during a race what went wrong, what can he improve upon. And, and I think that, that incredibly analytical mind and that, that attention to all hundred points of detail that have to go into winning Kona, it's like team sky in the tour de France, they looked at 1% marginal gains in every single aspect of that sport. And Sanders is kind of approaching triathlon like that. And I think just like Patrick Lang might be setting a new standard for, um, the speed that needs to be brought to the marathon Sanders might be bringing a new standard for the dedication and the analytics and the attention to detail that is brought to Ironman. Now, personally, that, that kind of makes me sad being somebody that when I was in uh, professional curling, because the Olympics came around and curling and all of a sudden there's, there's so much money in it. And the, the reward for being at the top of the world was so much greater than being in my case just 15th ranked in the world where there was no reward it was like we made two thousand dollars a year it took so much of the fun out of it it took a lot of the camaraderie out of it and i'd be sad if that is what happened to triathlon that a lot of the raw realism got taken out of it because everyone started taking it 
so seriously that every single aspect of the sport became a life or death decision that you're constantly analyzing but isn't it already kind of like that though <sighs> i mean i think triathletes by nature yeah are very a no but even analytical. even the the pr- in the pro ranks i mean this doesn't to take it to that level that he has that's one thing and he's a little bit of an outlier as a person but i mean i, I feel like the pros have been working like this for a long time yeah i, I would say that they they are they're a very fickle bunch I think triathlon by nature is a very fickle sport. Um, I think if, if anyone has seen one of my vlogs, they would know that I think that for the average age grouper and probably the average pro, one of uh, personally, I think a, a really good approach is to look at it as how can you stay in the sport longer as opposed to being successful in one year or two years. And I think that that overly analytical mindset is what can lead to mental burnout Hmm. and treating it more as like a, how can I make this part of my lifestyle that I enjoy every single minute of? I don't think you can take that hundred percent analytical mindset to it. I think Lionel can do it Mm -hmm. because he's fulfilled by seeing himself in a mirror and seeing, Oh, there's a flaw watch me fix it on the next stroke. Like Mm -hmm. that's how he gets his jollies. I don't think most people can function like that. Hmm. And I think that that's something that can lead to burnout. Hmm. So that, that's why I'd be sad if that analytical mindset started, especially if it started trickling down to, to the age groupers. I mean, pros, if they can do it more power to them, it is their life, but age groupers take their cues from pros and if that becomes the trend in pros, all of a sudden age groupers are going to say, oh, that's what I got to do. Hmm. And we're already an annoying A-type bunch of people who can't go out past 830. And for that to even increase more, I, I think that that would make me sad. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of somebody else who operates like a machine um, on Ooh. the women's side, Daniela Reef, uh, it seems like she can kind of do whatever she wants on the course and she's going to be a okay that was very interesting. Yeah, leading into the the race, I went and and watched the pro press conference, and even just watching Daniela Reef sit down was like ice. She was purposeful. She was focused. She didn't chat a lot with the people around her. She was there to win. She wasn't there to to have fun with the press, or at least my, my perspective. I mean, maybe it could just be, um, could be that she's shy, could be that she's not too chatty, but she looked so focused. So going into it, I, I thought that she was going to be tough to beat because she's like a machine. And the thing about Daniela's race that I, it makes me wonder who can ever beat her. She was five minutes back at 140 kilometers into the bike. She has 40 kilometers left, and five minutes is a huge deficit. She decides that for the last 40 kilometers of the bike, she's going to time trial it, go as fast as she can, leave nothing else on the bike, basically bike it as if she didn't have to run after. She goes and gains 10 minutes on Lucy Charles, the leader, at 140 kilometers in 40 kilometers. So this is like, let's say... I were to do a 40 kilometer time trial in an hour, somebody that's doing it in an hour and 10 is basically in another, another league altogether. Like that 10 minute gap is huge. Like that's, that's a different caliber of athlete. And she's probably doing it at under an hour. Lucy Charles is doing it 10 minutes slower in that last 40 K. And then in addition to that, Reef comes and does the fastest female run split on the day. So she leaves everything that she can in that last 40K of 180K ride and then still has the legs to run after it. Now, I'm not really taking a stance on this because I don't think it's, it's my place. I don't, I don't know enough about her or, or the pro field, but there were people that I was talking to while we were in T2 that were giving off the splits and they said that they thought she was doping. Ooh. because of that performance. Um, I, that yeah. doesn't get talked about a lot, not openly in this sport. I mean, it does in other sports like cycling. It's obviously for, for obvious reasons, it's spoken about a lot, but you don't hear much about it in triathlon or at least not. 
no, sort of from the outside of it, you don't. No, you don't hear about it a lot. One thing that I will say is a friend of mine who was who was getting into the the um, high ranking junior development ranks um, of of triathlon. He said that that it becomes so apparent that it's an option very quickly early in your career because the risk of doping is okay well you get caught and you're out of the sport the reward or the risk of doping and and or the the risk of not doping is that you're out of the sport anyway and you know that you're out so it's the same risk because you can't do well enough. because you yeah you can't do well enough and when you're a junior and your life is completely focused on being the best that you can in the sport it's like you have no option and the reward of potentially doping is that you can keep getting better. So he just said on a risk reward scale, okay, risk of doping is that you get caught and you're out of the sport. Risk of not doping is that you know that you're out of the sport 100%. And the reward of not doping is is personal satisfaction, but the reward of doping is potentially that you can be the best in the world. So he's like just on a grid of risk reward um like you're almost left with no choice. Now, I yeah, I I don't I don't know enough about the pros. I don't know enough about that situation. I don't know enough about them. I don't know enough about Daniela to say one way or another. Um, but her dominance right now is kind of leading people. It's causing in, that. In, yeah, in transition. And she's jacked. Like, she is so jacked. But to be able to do a 40K time trial and then pull out the fastest run in the field, uh, it's either so incredibly dominant that she is that genetic freak freak of nature or it's going to lead to people saying like this is a little bit too much well that's interesting that langa in his only his fourth iron man could have that kind of dominant performance could pass sanders on the you know all that nobody's rumbling about him juicing but daniela reef on the other hand Mm -hmm. everyone's rumbling about her juicing what's the difference (sighs) i think that it's i think that the difference is in her case she's crushing fields hmm. she she's killing fields by 10 20 minutes in some cases yeah that, that's hard to say and frankly I, I i don't really have an opinion on it that's strong enough because i, I don't have enough knowledge mm-hmm. to say one way or another what i will say is that i think that in most sports um as we've seen with recent documentaries like icarus like it's probably more common than we think oh sure yeah yeah so take her out of the equation and mm-hmm. you've got Lucy Charles, um, 24 years old. So is she, I mean, is she going to be Reef's competition coming up here? Is she the well, next one? Well, you know, what? I, I chatted about that with Coach Pat and I said, like, it's, I said to him, it's got to be clear that she's the one knocking at the gate. And he said, well, to be that good that quickly, does that mean that you overcooked yourself? That quickly as in that young? That young. Yeah, because normally... It's not until you're 30, 35, mm-hmm. 38. This is a later seeing, peak sport. Yeah. 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 Um, it, when you're young, you've got speed. When you're old, you've got endurance. Uh, it takes a long time to build endurance. So that's why you see folks like like Craig Alexander that is setting course records in his late 30s. And I think he was 40 when he set the previous course record. You see Jan Fredino graduating out of ITU and then going into long course. Lucy Charles goes from olympic hopeful for great britain in swimming takes that big engine goes into iron man and triathlon racing and all of a sudden is fantastic at long course and she's doing that without having a big base of endurance behind her well i mean she's got a huge engine so she has a big base of endurance but not like decades of endurance that so that tells me one of two things um my opinion originally was that holy smokes she is an endurance freak and we're going to see her setting records and winning for decades because she's just so built for this race that she needs a few more years of of training for it coach pat however comes in and he says well did she maybe just she built up so quickly because she was the swimming freak of nature that we see a lot of people that get really quickly really fast and, or really quickly, re- really fast, really quickly, and then they taper out because they did too much too soon. Hmm. So can she keep 
on that, that trajectory of getting faster? He said, well, I mean, that's a really big question. It's not as simple as she's 24. She did really well. Her best years are still in front best, of her. Yeah. It's not as simple as that. Right. It's can she keep getting faster and stay injury free? Cause hmm. she's still young. And when you're young, you're, you're fairly immune mm -hmm. to injuries. All of a sudden you turn 30 and your back hurts and your feet hurt and you got a sore ankle like me. And like, you know, it's not as simple as she's the next thing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Well, the day didn't look hard for her or Reef or Langa. It looked really hard for Sanders. Um, but I mean, we were out there on the course and that was a hot one. That was a was a tough. scorcher. It was mm -hmm. it was tough for us. Never mind. I honestly, truly, watching these people compete, the pros and the amateurs, it was mind boggling to me to think about being running out on the lava fields when I was walking around or bicycling around and I could take shelter and stop for a few minutes and sit under a tree if I <laughs> if had to. If there was shade, you found it. Yes, right. <laughs> Which a lot of people had to. I mean, it was. Yeah. 42 to well you're like a like, little mexican construction worker <laughs> like just finding the little patch of shade hey man that's for me <laughs> um but no really i mean anybody out there pe nobody anybody would would need that as just even a spectator it was 40 felt like 42 degrees celsius with the temperature and the humidity um and there was not a cloud in the sky that sun was absolutely scorching um and yet these folks are out on the lava fields for hours, right? Like I just, it, it boggles my mind that, that they can do this and survive. But actually there was a fairly high, um, did not finish rate, I guess, among pros. Yeah. I don't know. Highish. Yeah. Uh, I know that there were a lot of pros that had really hard days. Jesse Thomas, he, he had, was having a race that was going exactly according to plan. And then I think it was the last 16 miles. Basically he walked and was complete disaster. Sebastian Keenley. I mean, Sebastian Keenley. Gosh. Yeah. He had a hard finish. Um, our buddy that we did the last podcast with the night before John Joseph, he was looking for about a 12, 12 and a half hour. He did 1440. Wow. Um, but then uh, on the flip side of that, you've got records being broken in the bike and the run. Uh, I talked to, an age grouper, a uh, trainiac buddy that I made down there, Oliver Harkins, I believe, from Ireland. And this is a guy that trains in no hotter than 20 degrees Celsius, uh, call it 72 degrees Fahrenheit weather. And he had the race of his life. He mm -hmm. went under 10 hours. He did 9, 9 9.50, 9.34, I think. But I asked him, I said, was it an easy day or a hard day? And he said, you know what? It really depended on the time of day because of how the winds go mm, and the winds right. switch around so much in that course apparently that if you get out early enough it can be calm and you can go and you can smash the bike and then it's still not blazing hot out there and and there's a little bit of air movement in the morning for the pros however you get just a little bit later and maybe it could be 20 minutes later and you've, you're dealing with winds that are in your face going out, in your face coming back. You've got hotter weather later in the afternoon. You've got to deal with more heat for a longer period of time. And he said that I think the do not finish rate for the age groupers is basically right where it was. So it's not like it was an easy day or a hard day. And I think that goes to show that it, the... I think the conditions in Kona are so much more difficult than anyone gives them credit for that it it's it's not just you're racing the course you've also got to race the conditions so to compare two years ago performances to this year kind of performance and say ah oh, well you know uh, Patrick Lang just had the best day that's ever happened in Kona well you know what it could be the best performance paired with the best conditions mm -hmm. you, you you just don't know it's like one of those courses that that it, it's almost like racing on a different course year to year. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that race any better? Is that performance any better than last year's performance by Jan? Who knows? Maybe Jan's was even better. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe uh, Daniela and, and Langa just threaded the needle just right. Hmm. Yeah. Something that has often crossed my mind is that it doesn't seem like it actually matters how well you do in the swim. 
because you've got, I mean, it, not that it doesn't matter, but um, Josh Amberger coming out of the water very dominantly. Yeah, um, two minutes ahead of everyone. Yeah. I think it was, or a minute and a half. Lucy Charles, mm-hmm. um, Lauren Brandon, another name people might know. But yet, that doesn't seem to make a difference to what the end of the race is going to look like. Yeah, I think the what you see is that Josh Amberger, he goes out, he does well in the swim. Same with Lucy Charles, same with Lauren Brandon. They get a lead. And the only benefit that I can really see is that you don't have to, being out in front, you don't have to go and cook yourself on the bike to catch up to the leaders. Lionel Sanders and Sebastian Keenly, they've got to go and push massive power to make up that four and a half, five minute difference being in the second swim pack. Daniela Reef has to do that 40K time trial to catch up to Lucy Charles and Lauren Brandon. And they've got to cook themselves a little bit and burn a few more matches on the bike. But when it comes right down to it, the swim is only, well, what is it? It's like 10% of the overall time spent in the race. Mm-hmm. The bike is more than 50%. The run is is. 30 to 40 percent of the entire time spent in the race and this even trickles down to some of the numbers that i've seen when i started analyzing um itu that you can come out of the water in front and you know they always say that you can't win the the race in the swim but you can certainly lose it i almost don't even see that because you've had you've had people like marinda carfrey um sebastian keenly that come out minutes like five six seven minutes down and they've got so much time to make up for it that you know you look at at lucy charles she had to back up that swim performance with an awesome bike and an awesome run lauren brandon backs it up with an awesome bike but then she finishes like third last because she had the slowest uh, marathon Mm -hmm. so yeah, like congratulations, you came out of the water in first and whatever they call it in, in cycling that you get the preem bonus from your swim sponsors if if that's a thing in triathlon, and I'm sure there is. But it, you can't judge who's going to win the race based off of who's coming out of the water water in, in the front. They should put the swim at the end so you can cool off after all that biking and running. Yeah, I'm sure that they my, would appreciate that. That's my suggestion. I think they used to do that back in the 80s. And when, people died from drowning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get a cramp in the swim. That's enjoyable. Um, yeah, uh, no, I just think it should go at the end, like cool off after that day. Have a nice leisurely swim to end your race. No, yeah, uh, no, not quite. I don't know. Nobody asked me, but I think it's a good idea. Um, you were talking earlier about, uh, Lionel Sanders and how he's now not running as much on a treadmill because he needs that sort of outdoor feeling, you know, to get his body going side to side, et cetera. Um, is that the same for the bike? Cause it sounds like a lot of the pros are actually more pros are doing more cycling indoors as opposed to getting outside to cycle. Well, what I found when I was at inner bike a month before Kona actually happened is I was chatting with Wahoo and we see Zwift down there and there's a lot of tech going into indoor cycling, lots of money going into it. And you see little bits of people over the last few years and say your, your crit races locally or a few people here and there that are starting to do more and more training inside. And, and notably in this race, uh, Sebi does a ton of training indoors in his condo in Germany, I think it is, back home. Jan, over the last few years, about three years ago, he took a big leap up in how strong his bike was. And apparently that was when he committed to doing a lot more training inside. Lionel barely sees daylight. Like I say, he does almost everything on Zwift. And Lucy Charles is also a Zwifter. And what what the the kind of sentiment was when I was in Innerbike is everyone was saying that it's more purposeful time spent. You're not going to go and do a workout outside and you've got traffic to contend with and start and stop or wind in your face and let's say in my case I'm trying to do certain specific intervals out here training for half iron man Austin and I'm supposed to hold 210 watts for 30 minutes well if there's wind that 210 watts goes up to 235 and then down to 185 and then up to 240 and then down to 215 and it's just all over the map. And in addition to that, I'm out here training on the prairies where it's 
just bald prairies, no incline whatsoever. But the training bikes out here right now, um, I just picked up the Wahoo Kicker a couple days ago and pair that with the Wahoo Climb that's going to be coming out. I can load up half Ironman Austin's bike course and I can do the exact bike course with the exact resistance and the exact grade of my bike going up and down. And all of a sudden, I don't have to start and stop for traffic. I don't have to start and stop for flat tires. I don't have to take 20 minutes to put on a helmet and get my flat repair kit and all the nutrition that I need stuffed into my jersey pockets. So you're seeing a ton of athletes that are starting to spend more time on the bike indoors than they are outdoors. Now, the thing that I've always wondered about that is those first few rides outside where uh, we're getting out in, in the spring after the winter, that it feels like hell because lung butter. It, yeah lung butter and like the <laughs> sides of my back are so sore because I don't have that crosswind well I, you know what I what I'm finding just looking at the results of who has excellent bike fitness out there it's a lot of people that spend a lot of time indoors hmm. and a small portion of it outside so Maybe they're doing strength exercises to work on their back muscles uh, yeah, I or almost, something. I almost guarantee that they, right. they are. Or actually, you know what? I think Lionel Sanders um, doesn't. And he's jacked. <laughs> he's completely jacked. So he's naturally, naturally strong dude. Um, but yeah, I, I think over the, the next six months, I'm certainly going to be experimenting with doing a lot more purposeful training indoors and not having it just be like my junk miles that mm-hmm. I do in the winter. Yeah, I it certainly seems like there's something to it that some of the strongest bikers are doing a lot of time indoors. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, It was also interesting that the, that Kona seemed huge. You know, there's so many people watching so many people competing. I mean, it just, it's a giant event. Um, It's hard to believe that the USAT president is coming out saying the sport of triathlon is stagnant. I mean, it doesn't seem that way when you're at Kona, um, but maybe it is in the lower ranks. I don't know. Is, is the sport stagnant? Certainly seems like it to me. I, I have thought that locally here hmm. for a few years that it's seeming like the races are getting smaller and smaller. And I hear about say back in smaller and smaller and certainly less competitive. Hmm. Apparently back around late nineties, early two thousands, you would have six or seven guys here locally that would be battling it out for going sub 205 in an Olympic distance. Now you've got one or two. Hmm. You've got Pat Peacock. You've got um, you've got a high performance kid that's doing it. You know, maybe somebody comes in from out of province that can do it. Maybe, but you know, for the longest time, if Coach Pat would go and race a 202, he was guaranteed to win mm-hmm. for the last like 15 years. However. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I'm seeing when, when I was on the board of our local triathlon association, we were kind of seeing numbers that, you know, they were all, the numbers were basically the same for people that the total numbers, total, um, absolute numbers of memberships held throughout the year, but it was more one day racers hmm. that would come and do one triathlon and they wouldn't do a bunch. Check locally. it off their bucket list and they're done. Check it off their bucket list or they're just not racing here like me. Oh yeah. So yeah. I raced once locally this year, just once mm-hmm. did a little tune up race, but it's not my main race. Like Pat and I, we basically did this local race for data, mm-hmm. um, not to actually do a, a purposeful race here. And then I go elsewhere and I go elsewhere and I spend my dollars with the world triathlon corporation and Ironman. Mm-hmm. So I, I think what we might be seeing that I'm not yet sure how I feel about it uh, is that Ironman at the half distance and the full distance is gobbling up triathletes and that's where the vacuum is going. So mm. the local races are suffering. Right. The sprints yeah. and the Olympics. The sprints and, the, and yeah. the Olympics and the grassroots sports that, that bring people in and and instantly people are moving up to halves and and full iron mass well you see that in the comments on your youtube channel is that people are saying hey i've signed up for my first ever triathlon it's you know half iron half man, iron man so austin so. or full yeah. iron man whatever and it's wow <laughs> yeah yeah and and you know what i always say a lot of people get in my face and well face literally my digital face and say 
you know, how dare you, you look down at people's, at your nose, at people who are, who aren't taking it, aren't approaching the sport the same way you are. Maybe they just want to finish the race. You know what? I, I look at triathlon and endurance events as a test of what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, it's an opportunity to get yourself out of comfort and see what your mind and your body is capable of. And if you want to learn if you can finish a race, I can answer that question for you. It's yes. There, there is so much time that you have to swim, bike, and run in those cutoff times in a half Ironman and a full Ironman that it's not much of a challenge to go and finish one. Mm-hmm. I believe that the challenge and this is how I approach it, and it's not to say that I'm approaching it right, but this is just what I believe, that the challenge is how fast can you do it? What is your body capable of? Mm-hmm. Can you train enough and stay healthy enough and stay dedicated enough to to race your best race? Can you? Mark Allen said it when we interviewed him. He said he wanted to know how well he could make his body move mm-hmm. in time mm-hmm. and space. Yeah, And... And I mean, disrespectful to the sport might be very strong, but I think that you're cheating yourself out of finding out what you're capable of by just seeing doing if you the can hardest it. possible thing, just doing the longest possible yeah. thing just yeah. to say that, yes, you did it. Well, I think the saying, yes, you did it and you got the most out of your body that you possibly could. I think that's a challenge. And, well, and, you know, I, I too, if a lot of people go in and do the full Ironman as their first and it's their one and only because it hurts so much. It was such a long day. It was so much. They never do another one again, as opposed to you do a sprint, which is still going to be hard. I mean, I remember, you know, your earlier days and being around people at local races, uh, you know, run into an old friend or an high school friend or whoever who just did that sprint for the first time. And they thought they were going to die in the sprint, Mm -hmm. but it was not so hard that they were never going to do it again. And thus it became lifestyle because it was something I got a taste of it and I want more and I want to do better next time and I can do better next time. And I have the time to devote to the training because it's not as exhaustive to train for a sprint as it is to train uh, for a half Ironman or full Ironman. And then, you know, they're into the community. They are in the sport for a period of time. Whereas so many people that we seem to hear from through your channel, it's a one and done because they did an Ironman first. And it be, yeah. And it also becomes something that you, you take a baby step and mm-hmm. then you can take another baby step yeah. and you can take another baby step and you can see progress mm-hmm. in, in the two half Ironmans that I've done. I figured out some things in the first. I thought that I learned from them in the second. Um, what I learned in the second is that Taryn does not do well in heat mm-hmm. after being in Winnipeg winter, mm-hmm. all, uh, all winter for my training. Uh, I learned something there. And we learned. You got to Lionel it. Sanders it up. We got to build a sauna that you can yeah, we do run in in the basement. Yeah, we got to do that. <laughs> um, but if, let's say, if I were to just go and, I mean, I, I could finish a full Ironman tomorrow, easy, but Not probably, easy. Not probably easy. well, it'll be a tough day, but I know I could do it. But I, what would probably happen is if I jumped all those little baby steps, what would happen is I'd go and I'd do like a, 12 hour Ironman and then the next one would be a 12 and a half and then the next one might be 12 11 40 and then the next one might be 12 10 like uh, I'd be missing all those little baby steps and all that little knowledge about mm-hmm. what works for me with training yeah. that that I would just be surviving mm-hmm. each race instead of learning how to race it and right. learning, learning how to get the most out of my body so no, yeah. obviously there are people who want to do one and done and there's no judgment if that's what they want, mm. right? But I think there seems this, to be this, a lot of... This is just my, my yeah, approach. But and the, this is why, you know, people give me static about, I mean, this is how I'm going to come across always yeah. when I say like, I want to race it because mm-hmm. I want to see what my body is capable of. And I, I want to see, I want to see people get to the, to the depths of their soul. But and for some people, if they can keep going, just finishing that Iron Man is that mm-hmm. just, and that because, well, for many different reasons, right? So it's not, I think, 
If people want to do a one and done, that's fine. But if a lot of people on your channel are expressing that they really, they want to do this. They want this to be part of their life, that they admire the fact that you literally train every day. It's not a, oh, I got to drag myself to the gym and lift some weights. It's like you have a training plan. You are always on a training plan of some sort and they want that lifestyle too. But it's going to be much harder to get to that lifestyle to really integrate it when you don't, like you said, take the baby steps, try a couple of sprints and then try an Olympic and then try a half and then do your full is kind of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Build up a base, build up some endurance, build up some speed, learn your body, learn your nutritional needs, learn where what's going to be an injury point for you, blah, blah, blah. And you know, kind of go at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you know, I've watched your progression. I remember watching you do Olympics and you would be destroyed, you know, after the race, you'd, Oh my gosh, you would, it would be, you'd look terrible. You were beat down. You know, you could hardly speak on the ride home. You were so tired and so hungry. Yeah. That two, the, the second Olympic I did when I was just, uh, I went from sprint to Olympic to sprint to Olympic, bam, 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 bam. And I did a two fifty three mm -hmm. that day that you're thinking of in clear Lake. Yeah. And, and then we oh, rode was, home and you were oh, uh, shattered yeah. for weeks. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, right. But now, you know, you went on training rides in that heat in Kona rides and runs and you came back and I thought, oh boy, you're going to be a mess. And you weren't mm -hmm. at all. You looked great. Oh yeah. Because yeah. you've trained up you to it. Trained and that's up the whole to it. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now the flip side of all that, this, this is where I say Iron Man is doing a fantastic thing, sucking all the people out of the grassroots. Um, Holy shit, is that motivating? Mm, oh, sure like, it is. My, my God, do they put on a good show, whether it's Campeche or at Campeche or Austin or Kona. My God, do, is it motivating to see the people that go into it and how they, they announce it? And every time you go to an Ironman branded race, you know you're getting an awesome race. You're not mm -hmm. going to get bullshit that happens in grassroots level events mm -hmm. where maybe the course the run isn't, course isn't or, properly marked <laughs> oh i yeah i ended up in cornfields one one year yep. at one local race because there that. weren't volunteers on the course yet to guide me to where i went so i took a left when i took a should have taken a right um that ain't gonna happen you're gonna get a fantastic mm -hmm. experience you're gonna get an expo you're gonna have swag you're gonna have people announcing you and that motivation i think is also part of of what can pe keep people in the sport and draw more people into mm -hmm. the sport. So like, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword that yeah. on the one hand, I think it, uh, it's sucking people out of what makes it a lifestyle mm -hmm. for people, but it is also probably one of the biggest motivators that, that our sport has. But I would hazard to say that that amazing feeling of crossing the finish line, you're going to feel that when you complete a sprint too especially if it's one of your first races, you know, it doesn't have to be the biggest game in town to feel amazing and to feel accomplished. Mm. Right. If I ever did a sprint, Oh my God, there'd be crying at the finish line. Let me tell you. Well, we'd have to rebrand the entire channel. You're not NTK anymore. Well, there you go. No so I guess I can't ever, but you know, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it would be, that would be a major accomplishment and, yeah. and still is. So I, I, it's too bad every time I look through the comments on the YouTube channel that people are saying, Oh, signed up for my first ever race and it's full Iron Man. this. It's like, Oh, that's, I don't know. I feel like, you know Oh, that's I, too bad. You know what? I don't, I don't actually feel bad for that because it all depends on I, I don't think it's a too bad, depending on how they they enter it with their mindset. Mm. The thing that gets me is when people say that, they say to me, you know what, Taryn, it's time that you did a full Ironman. So we sh so we saw that you were totally committed to the sport. Huh. Well, if they don't see you every single day of the week of the, every single day of the year training, as and you know working on getting faster and better and learning stuff and researching, if they don't see that as committed, then they can just. You know. Yeah, well, you know, it's also a thing like I also know that my commitment is, yes, I want I want to race. I want to race Kona one day. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's not going to happen just from going and bashing out the next race being a full Ironman. Right. And yeah. I know that it's going to take me probably three, four years and probably stepping up a couple of age groups before I'm in the age group of 30 to 34. It's like a bunch of ex pros mm -hmm. that are in that age group. I've got to. I've got to build up speed and stay healthy for probably three, four, five years. And then you can beat Oliver and, and from then, Ireland. Oliver from Ireland. Oh, he's fast. But I, like, I think that's what it's going to take 
to do it. And, and when people say, Hey, we need to see your commitment, go do a full Ironman. Well, I'm gonna, mm-hmm. but I want to do it right. Yeah. And I want to be able to race it. Yeah. Cause a daily video showcasing your training, training is no commitment at all. No, no, exactly. Just people. Yeah. Um, so just back to the race for a second. Obviously we were mm-hmm. in America. We were in the States, Hawaii, of course. And, um, the top American on the course was Andy Potts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's for the t- zillionth time he's the top American. Yeah. And, uh, Tim O'Donnell fared okay. Jesse Thomas fared all right. Mm, um, Jesse Thomas did not fare all right. Okay. All Jesse right, Thomas a had a tough day. Okay. Jesse Thomas was, I like his hair though. He's got great hair. He's got good hair. Um, <laughs> Dave Scott had said uh, in another interview that it's uh, U.S. that has the depth in triathlon. You, he said that actually, sorry, uh, she read my notes there and, and I did not give her very good notes. Um, he does not have the depth in, that U.S. does not actually have oh, well, very good depth in triathlon. Garbage notes you gave me on that? They were notes to myself, as a matter of fact. So garbage notes. Um, yeah, so what what Dave Scott is seeing that, that he's commenting on is that it's been so long since we've seen an American on top of the podium in Kona on the men's or the women's side. It's like consistently Germany, Australia, um, New Zealand, um, and the occasional U S athlete that gets in there on top of the, uh, on the podium, but nobody has been on top. And what Dave Scott said last week is that we just don't have the, we, well, the U S we're Canadian, uh, our friends from across the border don't have, don't have the youth programs that they have in Australia. I believe in Australia to graduate high school to get your your gym grade you need to have completed a triathlon what mm-hmm. wow yeah whereas in in the states apparently they're just they're even doing away with gym as a course phys so ed phys ed so you're getting a lot of athletes that maybe track athletes might be swimmers and you you have like say a gwen jorgensen um, who would be the exception, but, but her story is that she was a phenomenal track athlete, or I think, I think she was a swimmer first, phenomenal swimmer. And then kind of started going through the college ranks as a swimmer, realized that she wasn't going to be an Olympian. So then she became a track athlete. I think it was that way or, or conversely the, the other way. And she wasn't going to go to the Olympics as a track athlete, but she was pretty good in both of them. And somebody said, well, you know what, maybe because you're okay in these two, you could pick up biking, learn how to bike, and then be a triathlete. And she's a phenomenal triathlete. But it's like triathlon in the U.S. is getting the leftovers of other sports. So, um, you know, are, are, are we going to be able to see a U.S. athlete atop the podium? I don't know. Like Heather Jackson was on the women's side was that hopeful this year. And she placed fourth. Mm -hmm. And again, it was people from abroad that made it on top of the podium on the women's side and the men's side. Canadian Lionel Sanders. Yeah, Canadian Lionel Sanders. Um, uh, But yeah, I mean, like, say again, speaking to it from from the curling standpoint, what we're finding in Canada is we're still on top of the podium in the world, world, but it's, it's always been left up to the curlers to figure it out and to get on top of the podium. There isn't a very big high, high performance development program. And over the last 10 years, we've found consistently that other countries knocking that, at the door, knocking at the door. And we went from being dominant, like at, at worlds, it was Canada, Canada, mm-hmm. Canada, 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 Canada was consistently yeah. the gold medal winner. Now it's like Canada, Sweden, Canada, Norway, Canada, Scotland. Scotland, and they're starting to chip away at that. And it is those countries that are actually putting money and a development program into curling that is is kind of knocking us off of our high horse. The only reason that we're still up there is because the volume. amount, the volume, yeah, the amount of curlers that we have here is like a hundred times that of mm-hmm. any other country. So just by nature, we're going to have better curlers because we've got a bigger pool. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you think of that on a per capita basis of how many people, how few people in other places they have to pull from mm-hmm. and they're coming to our exact level by yeah. being intentional about it. I think that you need to 
like that, that's kind of where the United States is. They have more triathletes than anywhere else in the world. Hmm. Um, but even with that, they're not on top. So I think you need a development program. Maybe it's an Ironman development program. Maybe it's a youth triathlon program. Maybe you don't take phys phys ed out of school. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Something like that. But, uh, but that's what Dave Scott said that, Hmm. that you need to develop tougher, tougher, more sports oriented kids earlier on and develop them into triathletes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very. Well, let's, uh, let's bring it full full circle here. Full circle to good old Jan Ferdino. Mm -hmm. That was, that was a good story. Uh, yeah, for anyone that, that didn't see the day, Jan Fredino, he biked with the super bikers, came off the bike, I want to say, in, in fourth. And I was in transition with a camera watching everyone come off the bike. And all of a sudden, I see Jan whipping around the corner right in behind Cameron Worf and Sebastian Keenley and Lionel Sanders. And he's not that, that kind of biker. He's a good biker. He's not a... He's not, he's a, not the best biker. Not the best biker. But he can hold his own. And then all of a sudden I see him coming out of the tent, having changed into his run gear. And all of a sudden he's walking about, I think it was maybe six or seven miles later, he's on the ground with a locked up back. And he had a back spasm that was so bad that he had to lie on the ground for 10 minutes to stretch it out. And his race was done, but he still, well, we'll pull up the time here. He still did. I think he placed 20th overall. Here, we'll go find old uh, yawn can you pick up the story here while i look for the time it was a hot and humid Hmm. day in kona the sun was bright in the sky not a cloud to hide behind um (laughs) anyway yeah yawn uh yawn was in a considerable amount of pain in fact when the report started coming in uh something's happened to yawn people thought he had actually dropped out of the race um that was kind of the rumor that was going around uh, that he had stopped. In fact, he hadn't, uh, as you mentioned, he did lay down to kind of deal with that back spasm, but then, um, he was walking and he was just, he was going to continue walking the course. And I mean, the, you had to feel for the poor guy. He was clearly not doing well, but he kept on moving, which was just truly, truly amazing. And, you know, as we were at the finish line, all of a sudden you hear this roar coming from the crowd and there's Jan kind of running up the finish chute. And it was, I felt so sad for him when he crossed the finish line. And he just gave this gigantic shrug like, eh, mm-hmm. well, I guess I did it. Um, well, it was I felt awful for kid. the guy. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, he that's amazing to me that he did finish after all that, that he kept on going. I mean, good for you. For wow. The guy who was pegged to be the winner to ending, you know, laying on the ground and still finishes 20th, which goes to 30, show you 35th. something. Oh, 35th. I've got it here. 35th but in nine hours, 15 minutes. Unreal. Like just still com- <laughs> take, a t- take a 10 minute nap in the middle and you still finish 35th in the well, world. Well, he was fresh. Yeah, he, was, yeah. <laughs> he had a nap, he was fresh. Yeah, it's part of his taper process. Yeah, yeah uh, it, was, uh, it was a testament to the amount of respect that I believe people have for Kona, mm-hmm. that you have athletes that took a spot from another athlete to race in the most important race our sport has to offer. You, some of the the announcers out there said that you deserve, you you owe it to that course and that race, and your competitors to finish and not just take it well, out. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you're injured, he was injured. I think that's a little that goes a little far. If you're injured, I don't think you owe it to anybody. You owe it to your body to do what's right for your body. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, think that's a bit of a, an overstatement. You owe it to the course to finish. Well, come I on. If you're hurt, if, you're hurt. Yeah, that might be strong, but I, I say that it's a sign of respect. It's a big sign of respect. Well, sure, and I mean, course. but but what, did he did he finish because he respected the course, or did he finish because he's a hell of a competitor and he wasn't? He felt he could still move, so he still moved. What, you know I that. No, I, I think it's also part of the camaraderie. You look at say Jesse Thomas. He talked after the the event. Uh, if you haven't, if you don't follow Jesse Thomas, go follow him on on Instagram. Yeah. Look at the day after or the afternoon of that race, and he did uh, four. I think it was four minute long posts, uh, video posts on Instagram talking about the hard day, and he really started choking up in post number three, where he was talking about how he would be walking, and everyone who was passing him, all of his competitors who are out there like they're supposed to be his opponents mm-hmm. they would stop and try to get him running with them hmm. and be like come on jesse like run to the next aid station with me 
And I think it, it like that along with Jan still continuing on and doing what he can is a sign of respect to your competitors. And, and I don't know. I more see it, it as I just, I more see it as this is the kind of people who do this sport. Mm. I don't, I don't know that it's, I mean, now you're the triathlete and I'm not, so I'm just speaking from what I see and what I saw out there. But again, I, I don't, I don't know that it's like, oh, it's Kona, so I respect it and I have to finish. I mean, I just think that's who Jan is. He was not going to let this back spasm and whatever other problems he had beat him, that these other athletes, that they're good enough to say, yes, we're going to, we're going to bring you along, Jesse, we're going to help you out. I don't, I don't know. Is that because they respect Jesse or is that because this is just who the kind of people that get into this sport? I, I, that's more what I see and less about just this, well, we respect it. So we're going to have to help. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's a tough call because there were, there were also Michelle Vesterby and I think it was Alicia K that pulled out Mm -hmm. of the race. And, um, so does that mean they don't respect the course? They don't respect their competitors. I I think that just meant that they're, they had to respect their own bodies. I mean, that has to come first, right? Look down at them for, for having to pull out, um, I don't know. I would say that it's it's an ultimate badass move to continue on. Oh, for sure it is. I mean, Jan, that's how could you not respect a guy like that? He's he's a neat personality to begin with. He's a he's a cool and entertaining guy, but for to see him do that, now that's like, okay. You know, if you mm. if you'd never watched the sport and that's the first taste of it you got, you're going to remember that guy. You're going to root for that guy. Yeah. And, and that's also you know, at at Jan's level, he's he's looked at under a microscope and the entire world is looking at him. And if he can't motivate people to be the best athlete that they can by winning the race, he still has the opportunity to motivate people to be the best athlete they can, even with a back spasm to still finish the race. Yeah. And, and that kind of comes around full circle to what I was saying of doing the most that you possibly can, bringing your body to the brink of, of its capabilities and continuing on. Mm-hmm it, it kind of comes around to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is Kona 2017. That is Kona 2017. Yeah. Thank you all trainiacs for listening, watching, mm-hmm. uh, on YouTube. Uh, I'll say that, uh, it was kind of funny while we were there that in the first couple of days when I would reach out to, to people who have been in the sport, whether it was announcers or media people or, or business people, about getting an interview with them or a little bit of time for a meeting, they would say, well, you know, who are you? Can you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, this triathlon? Yeah, who are you? What, do you, what do you want? Yeah. yeah. Who are you? What do you want? And then when we would start actually talking to them or they would look at my channel or companies that have actually reached out to me since Kona, um, who had watched the coverage and they're seeing the comments and, and the amount of views and the amount mm-hmm. of people that follow, um, it was kind of like a triathlon Terran Trainiac community coming out party. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, cause it's not just that you have subscribers and views on the, on the videos. It's that people are commenting and having discussions and you well, know, and, every and, single day. And these business people, the, these commenters before they reach out to people like me, I've, I've heard them say that, they read those comments like they they want to make sure that I haven't gone and bought 23,000 followers and they go and they look at the comments and they look at the engagement right. and they see, wow, you have a really cool community of people mm-hmm. that are are not just into what you're doing, but you're you're helping them get into their own transformation stories. Mm-hmm. And. Um, yeah, like as, as much as it's cool to go there and be the media person and triathlon Terran and take selfies with people. The only reason that we're able to do that is because all of you take the time out of your day to listen and follow and reach out to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. It's pretty cool. How many people came up to you randomly in Kona from around the world to say, Hey, I'm a trainiac. Uh, and yeah. identifying themselves as such. Um, and, you know, I think that, or people running past, where were we? Uh, we were on Ali'i Drive and some cyclist, hey, triathlon Taryn. I mean, yeah. I don't know how she could even see you. She was going so fast past, but. Uh, she recognized my nipples. Oh, You're, right. Yeah, my yes. nipples are the most famous nipples on YouTube. I you think. and the 
running shirtless. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But yeah, was, no, that was, was that was pretty neat. And um, just, you know, validating that all the effort of doing videos every single day, which cuts into our actual life, um, mm-hmm. that it is, you know, it's getting out there. It's reaching people around the world, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. And with that, I'll say if you are in Austin and you see me and you have that little bit of like, well, should I say hi or should I not? Maybe he doesn't want to be bothered. No, I want to be bothered very much. Yeah. Because that, that is the absolute coolest part of getting out of Winnipeg and going to Interbike or Kona or Austin that when I get to meet people. Is meeting the people that you're doing this for. Yeah. And, and it also like it feels like we're part of a team. Mm-hmm. And just up here in Winnipeg, like coach pat and all the gang they're like taryn he's got the camera again like that's Mm -hmm. like they're they're so unimpressed with it by now that it's like just another thing Mm -hmm. that it's not a novelty to them anymore Mm -hmm. um so getting like when you whip out the camera at dinner when we're having dinner Mm -hmm. well uh, yeah and, and now being able to connect with people abroad who i don't know Mm -hmm. um that's what kind of makes it real yeah. because sometimes it just feels like talking to a camera, um, which is an inanimate object, but Mm -hmm. to know that there are other people all around the world that are tuning in. It's cool. So indeed that is all. Thank you. You're giving him a reason to live people. (laughs) Feed my ego. Thank you. Trainiacs.